Hi, this is Kulneet Singh from Team 10 of the Embedded Systems Design class, and this is our project video. The other group mates are Richard No, Brendan Harris, and the Harry Serrano. To introduce our project, we designed a package pickup and drop off autonomous system. We employed a tri rover for movement and pickup from drop off locations. A pixie cam was used to identify packages and platforms by color. A robotic arm was used with a claw grip to pick up and drop off packages. An ultrasonic sensor was used to avoid obstacles. Here's uh, our system block diagram. As you can see, we have a Raspberry Pi server in the middle of everything, and it's connected to multiple TI boards and connected to our components here. Robotic arm, tri-rover, Pixie 2, and ultrasonic sensor. Our constraints were that we're all required to use a TI board, one per team member. We're required to use a tri-rover for uh, the controlled via the PID algorithm. We're required to use 3 plus degree of freedom arm that was under $100. We were required to use a Raspberry Pi server and all the messages were communicated over MQTT in a JSON format. The total project cost must be less than $400. All of our constraints were met successfully in this project. So I will be talking about the robotic arm component now and we chose to go with the Arduino arm Uno 2.0. So here's a robotic arm system diagram. As you can see here, it was powered by a USB power supply connected to a breadboard and powered all the servos individually. And then the PWM signal came from the TI board. And uh, each of the servos are in the joints of the arm to control the arm. And then the, uh, the TI board was connected to the Raspberry Pi server via Wi-Fi and was communicating over MQTT. To give you more about my design and implementation, uh, basically the, the each of the servo motors is controlled by a PWM signal much like this one where it has a 20 millisecond PWM period which translates to 50 Hertz frequency uh, and basically go uh, one to two millisecond D cycle translates to zero degrees to 180 degrees as you can tell if this part was over here that would be zero degrees if this little arm thing over here would be at 180 degrees that would translate to a two millisecond uh, duty cycle and it required five volts of power and here's the pinout for each servo motor. We have the PWM signal coming from the TI board uh, in orange. In red, we have the VCC power coming from the USB power supply. And in brown, we have the ground coming from both the power supply and the TI board. A little bit more about my algorithm. Uh, each, uh, basically the TI board subscribes to a move motor uh, topic. And each time it receives a message uh, it basically goes through the algorithm. Uh, it keeps track of the current state of all the motors. There's a finite state machine used to change each motor angle one degree at a time, which uh, uh, basically allows us to have a very smooth movement. The hardware timer was used to change the PWM cycle every 20 milliseconds, and it goes through all of the motors until the goal state is achieved for all the motors and then it publishes a done moving message that way the server knows that the complex movement has completed. Okay, so I'm going to be demonstrating the test cases uh, that I wrote for the Arduino Arm Uno and this is basically our robotic arm component of our demonstration and basically there's a Python script called boardsim.py and there are six test cases on that so i can enter any number from one through six to run individually or i can enter 10 to run the entire script and that is what i'll be demonstrating now so i'm entering 10 into the script and now as you can see it's running test case one and it's now sending multiple uh, move motor commands to the ti board uh, and the TI board is then uh, subscribing to that message, moving the arm, and then uh, after that, it sends a message back to the simulation script that is also subscribed, 
Uh, basically, on the right side of the screen, you can see that uh, it's a mosquito uh, subscribed to server slash done moving. And each time the TI board has done its complex movement, it is then uh, move. Uh, it then publishes a done command uh, to let the server know that it has finished moving its complex motion. The reliability of the robotic arm uh, ran into some trouble because of the cheap servos that were used uh, from China and they were plasticky and not very reliable. Uh, one of the motors became super jittery after a lot of testing. Um, sometimes when the servos were at certain angles, they can be compromised uh, and they'll start squeaking very loudly. And if you, if you basically send a PWM signal that is too uh, the duty cycle is too much or if it's too little then it can cause the servo motors to uh, to mess up uh, the USB power supply connection sometimes would mess up due to bad uh, soldering overall the if conditions remain close to ideal it can run pretty well for the robustness of the robotic arm basically whenever an MQTT command is sent by the simulation servo script and it's not received by the TI board, then it would cause, uh, it would require us to restart the entire server because um, the simulation script would be in a hang state. Sometimes the claw motor does not unclamp properly just by giving the command to because uh, it clamps too tightly on the, uh, on basically the foam cube and it does not, even if it's sent a command to unclamp, it does not work. And the last thing was that uh, if the if the cube was dropped for whatever reason, the entire system would have to be re reset. So those were some of the problems with robustness. But overall, the system is fairly robust against errors. This is the rover's obstacle detection system. The obstacle detection system consists of a single HCSR04 sensor. The sensor calculates the distance using this formula here. Uh, here's a quick breakdown of what each part of the formula means. The duration is basically the time between sending a ping and receiving a ping divided by two. A ping is basically an ultra, a high frequency signal that is sent by the server. Um, this is how pings are sent and received. Um, as you can see, multiple pings are sent, and if an object is in front of the sensor, then those same pings get reflected back towards the sensor. Uh, the duration of all this is divided by two, since we're only concerned with how long it takes for a ping to return. Going back to the formula breakdown, um, 29.1 is just the pace of sound, which is one divided by the speed of sound. And then since the sensor reported that the distance in centimeters, the 100 was used to convert to centimeters. Once the sensor is done uh, calculating the distance, um, it sends the distance information in, J in JSON messages. Um, JSON is a way to store data. A JSON message consists of several fields that describe the attributes of the message. And I'll go over um, uh, what the JSON message looks like in the next slide, or the next two slides. So this is the JSON message for the sensor. The ID basically tells us um, where the message is coming from, in this case, the ultrasonic sensor. The publish field tells us how many messages have already been published or sent by the sensor. Um, for the received field, since the sensor only ever sends messages and never receives any messages, the received field is always going to be zero. Uh, the distance field just has the distance in centimeters. And the time field just uh, contains the total duration of the sensor's operation. This is the demo for the ultrasonic sensor. 
I'll be showing how the sensor works when the rubber is moving towards an obstacle. To simulate that, I'll be moving a box towards the sensor. The left screen is, a, is the main code for the sensor. Once I start the program, JSON messages will be sent to the MQTT server. You will be able to see the messages appear in this area here. The right screen is a Python script. It will get the distance data from the MQTT messages and then create a graph. So now I'll just start the sensor. Okay, now it's time to look at the graph. As you can see, the distance, which is the distance between the rover and the obstacle, decreases as the obstacle gets closer to the rover. Um, this is pretty much exactly what I wanted. The sensor is pretty reliable. A JSON message was sent to the MQTT server once every 500 milliseconds. Um, overall, the sensor had no issues with MQTT, and pretty much everything was smooth. For robustness, the sensor's distance values could have been more accurate. There was a margin of error of 5 to 7 centimeters below the actual distance. Looking back, I could have corrected the error using this, you know, within my code. However, during development, I ran into several issues uh, while integrating the MQTT code along with the sensor code. The rover handles the navigation aspects of the project. This includes movement and pathfinding. To move, a PI algorithm is used to adjust the power to the motors to help it to reach it the target speed. What this algorithm essentially does is increase the motor speed by some proportion of the current error and then adjust the power slightly based on the total sum of the error until the target speed is reached. On the pathfinding side, there are two aspects, obstacle avoidance and searching. When tracking, the rover will turn around until the goal gets into view of the pixie cam. The goal's x-coordinate from the pixie cam is received, and based on where it is with respect to the center of the screen, the rover will turn in that direction. If nothing is found after a full 360 degree turn, the rover will move in a random direction and start again. When avoiding a detected obstacle, the rover will turn slightly past the point where the detected obstacle is far enough away from the ultrasonic sensor. The rover proceeds forward and then takes a 105 degree turn towards the obstacle to check if it has passed the obstacle or not. If the rover has cleared the obstacle, it will move forward and continue the search. If not, it turns back and repeats the process. In regards to movement, the implementation of the PI algorithm was made reliable by using a script to automate the calibration process. This resulted in optimal KP and KI constants and allowed the motors to stabilize at their target speeds within 2 to 3 tenths of a second. The PI aspect of the rover is also robust in that constants can be freely assigned using MQTT messages. The speed of the motors can also be graphed in order to verify correct implementation. To test the reliability of the rover's navigation, a simulation was implemented to simulate its environment. Some discrepancies do exist, such as the rate of MQTD messages being sent and the mapping of the rover's actual position. However, the rover is able to successfully navigate to its goal using just simulated MQTT messages. The simulation also shows that the pathfinding algorithms involved are robust enough to navigate around simple obstacles. The rover is also shown to be able to tolerate delayed messages and readjust accordingly given the simulation's simplified output rate.
Pixiecam was used to identify packages and drop off areas by their shape and color. It communicates with the TI board through I2C by sending a get box request to the Pixie. The Pixie returns a packet containing the height, width, center X and Y coordinates, and the signature of the largest block that is found. If there are no blocks found or the data for a detected block is found to be inaccurate, such as an invalid block size or signature, no message is published to MQTT. The Pixie component is fairly reliable, though there is an error where it stops working eventually. After approximately 2,000 I2C transactions, the Pixie stops responding to the request packets sent by the TI board. Since the transaction is started every second, this roughly equates to approximately 30 minutes of runtime. This is likely an issue with my code as the Pixie itself is a widely used and reliable product. I was able to verify that the TI board was sending the correct request packet using the logic analyzer, however the Pixie does not respond to that packet. The Pixie is fairly robust with some caveats. It is very sensitive to lighting conditions and this can cause the size of a detected object to change even when both the Pixie and the object are stationary. The sensitivity to light can also cause objects such as markings on the walls to be misidentified as a package or to not detect any signatures at all if they were trained in a different lighting condition. You can see that there is a green block detected. As I move it forward, it increases in size. As I move it from side to side, it changes position. And as I move it back, it returns to the original size. As I add a second block larger than the original one, the script will begin to recognize that one instead of the smaller one in the background because it's the largest block. And as I move the green one to be larger, it'll show the green one instead of the orange one. If I remove the green one, it'll only return the orange one because that's the only one in the field. As I cover it, you can see how it's sensitive to different lighting conditions, so the slightest shadow will cause it to not recognize an object. 